the Period Place podcast. Shark Week. <laughs> Riding the cotton pony. Yeah. I have salsa in my taco. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Rag Week. Oh. Rag Week. Oh, that's bloody hell. Bloody hell. Okay. Bloody hell, Harry. <laughs> Period Place podcast. Thanks to our mates at You by Cotex. Oh, hey, girl. Kia ora. We're here. Episode three, periods and nutrition. I'm so excited for this episode. And you know what? Everyone listening, thank you so much for the feedback so far on episode one and two. It's been a really exciting journey. The and messages we are getting on Instagram are yeah. so bloody beautiful. Oh, I know. Amazing. And it's just so cool to know that, you know, we're speaking to a space that maybe, you know, like you felt that needed to be talked to. So I'm just happy to be here and be, um, here. Yeah, be here for periods of nutrition. We've got so many cool um, episodes on the way. I mean, next week we're going to be talking to my friend Danny Fennessy about periods and taboos. Um, we're going to be talking to a sexologist, Morgan Penn, in a couple of weeks about just everything. Bring on vaginal mapping. Oh, M- Morgan is just like, she's out the gate in the best way possible. Yep. And so I'm so excited for that. But to maybe rein it in just a little bit this week, we are talking to Sarah Widowson and she is a um, registered dietitian here in New Zealand, um, a nutritionist, if you will. And she just knows everything about um, making your body, your men- like your mental health, your physical health, all of it needs to connect. And like, that can be the way you're consuming, not just foods, but consuming exercise, consuming sleep, just all those things that you should shouldn't ordinarily be ticking off in a box. Um, she's just going to give us a rundown on how it all connects and how it makes a period better. All right, so here we go. Episode, Episode three. three. Hey, it's Danica here. Just before we start the podcast, You by Kotex believes a period should never hold you back, which is why, as well as keeping you covered and stress-free during your period, they're pumped to support us in smashing stigma and starting positive conversations to support people with periods. They also love the Period Place podcast and want you to know that you can catch replays along with more info on them and their products at you by Kotex, A-U-N-Z, on Facebook, Instagram, or on their website. Thanks for the support, team. All right. Back to the podcast. Welcome. Thank you for coming. Woo-hoo. Thank you for having me. Um, just to give us a rundown, Sarah, do you just want to tell um, everyone what you do, like what your role involves, you know, what you're all about? So um, I am a registered dietitian and my baby is a platform called Your Monthly. So I work with clients uh, face-to-face here in Christchurch. I work at a women's health clinic um, and I also support clients virtually as well. And I created Your Monthly as an online space trying to take the conversations I was having like in a clinical setting with my clients Mm -hmm. to a wider platform being social media Um, and a lot of the work that I do is around um, helping people to understand that being fertile is so much more than just making babies Mm -hmm. and helping people to appreciate and understand uh, that food is an act of self-care and a lot of the work that I do is around uh, helping people to have um, happy, healthy hormones and to achieve that with food and lifestyle as well. So, yeah, that's a little bit about me. That's amazing. And wh- what would your um, like personal experience with your own um, sort of menstruation cycle, having a period, do you think, did you have a lot of education around it? Was it a, an experience that made you feel empowered or, or not? Like, what was that like for you? Yeah. No one's ever asked me that before. And it's Ooh. interesting being um, on the other side of the questioning around mm-hmm. period health. I um, I often joke with my clients that my education around, you know, puberty and period health at school um, was basically about condoms mm-hmm. and putting yeah. out condoms um, and very little actually around what it, what it meant to have a period and what was normal and what was abnormal. Mm-hmm. Um, in my own personal experience, I think I've tried nearly every type of contraception there is on the market um, and learnt kind of the hard way around what's helpful and unhelpful in my body. And uh, when I was at university, I think I first tapped into what it means to be uh, healthy when it comes to period health and looking at it as a vital sign when I lost my period um, during some running training. Uh, and it happened again when I was in a pretty high stress job when I first left university. So I have, I guess, a personal interest and experience mm. in what it's like to lose a period from an environmental situation and also um I guess, under nutrition, and I've also had the experience of getting my period back and feel really proud and staunch around teaching people that they deserve to have a pain-free regular period mm-hmm. and helping them to achieve that. I think that's really, um, from my anecdotal evidence about Crown mm-hmm. Tower, mm-hmm. I think that's actually quite common the first time that people with periods really start to understand what's going on is when they lose it for the first time Mm -hmm. from stress, from um, running, from partying too hard. Mm -hmm. At first it's like, oh, great, I didn't get it. I don't have to deal with this. And Mm -hmm. then, you know, 
hang on, the penny drops and it's, wait, why am I not getting this? This, ha- this has mm. to be a sign that something's wrong. I never knew that periods were a sign that something's wrong. Yeah, absolutely. I think as well, like tracking your cycle, you um, it's something that I've only done in my like most recent years of living. Mm-hmm. But prior to that, you're right, it's either it's here or it's not here and it's my only measure of something being different yeah. rather than is it heavier, is it lighter, is it more regular? those other things we should be looking for. Do you think your own experience with um, or, you know, and struggles maybe with your personal period is what made you want to, like, help other people with theirs? Was it, was that something you always were interested in? Uh, I think I've always been really interested in hormones. Mm-hmm. So my first ever job as a dietitian was in the area of diabetes, so talking a lot um, about hormones in that context. Mm-hmm. And then I think what I found really rewarding was actually less about my own experience and more around holding a space for people mm-hmm. to hear them um, and to help them when they weren't uh, being helped or heard and I guess with other health professionals or um, maybe inviting them to think about you know periods being a vital sign and helping them on that journey and it's so rewarding I just can't even tell you how incredible it feels to get emails like I got my period back or Mm-hmm. Um, you know, my polycystic ovary syndrome is, is healing um, or I'm pregnant. I get the most, um, yeah. And, the, and like maybe the simplest of terms, this may be not the right question to ask. Maybe I'm not sure if I'm wording it quite correctly. But how, like, how intertwined is the food you eat to having a good experience with your body, just in general? Huge. Huge? Absolutely huge. Mm-hmm. But it's, it's, not, um, it's not in isolation. I think food gets a lot of attention, and, and rightly so. Food absolutely impacts on, you know, for example, hormones. We need amino acids from protein, mm-hmm. protein-containing foods to make hormones. We need fat from foods to make hormones. Um, if you deprive your body of glucose or glycogen from carbohydrates, that changes pathways in your body that will regulate or down-regulate hormones. So food is really important. But what I see mostly with my clients alongside food is actually stress, mm. sleep issues, um, and a difficult relationship with exercise. They're probably like the other three pillars that I tend to talk about with my clients. Mm. But food is huge. Um, but once we've kind of exhausted that conversation, I think it's important to look at those other areas of looking after a body as well. I feel like there's a massive moral stigma attached with food. Mm -hmm. Um, I was listening to a podcast on the way here and the episode was talking about just how shit people are made to feel. You get a skinny white girl in a McDonald's um, with her hair pulled back with a nice centre part Mm -hmm. and she's snacking on a burger and people go, oh, look at her. She's having a treat. Mm -hmm. Good on her. Mm -hmm. And then you get, um, it could be a a person who is the same age as her but they're overweight Mm -hmm. and their skin colour's not so light and mm-hmm. people look at them and they go, oh, look at them having a burger. Bet they bloody are, eh? Bet that's mm. all they eat, yeah. you know? Are they eating their quinoa and avocado? Yeah. And and there's so yeah, there's so much moral stigma attached to um, to eating. Like, we keep moving the goalpost on, on what is healthy. Fasting. Fasting. You know, that's a, yeah. 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 So, I feel like everyone yeah. I know is either um, keto, uh, paleo, uh, intermittent mm. fasting. Like, yeah. those are kind of everything I hear of at the moment. Mm. And, like, I don't think there is a lot of um, education, especially for, you know, people with experiencing periods and stuff and how much that actually influences um, our body. Like- totally. One of the biggest ones that I talk about with my clients is trying to debunk this idea that we need to be fasting to be healthy. I think that's the biggest rise that I've seen in the last 12 months in my work mm-hmm. is yeah. more and more people glorifying this idea of starvation because that's what it is. Um, and when you think about how a human body drives reproduction systems and therefore periods are actually the least exciting part of a, a reproductive cycle. Ovulation is the most exciting part, mm-hmm. but that has to happen um, in a healthy way and it has to happen before a healthy period can take place. And if you think about the brain being deprived of nutrition and also what happens with fasting is you get a rise in stress hormones, so cortisol, which is why as well a lot of people with anxiety um, being, being fed helps with their stress levels and that kind of anxious buzz that they can experience. So with fasting, not only do you have um, that deficiency in in energy going on, but you also have an excess of stress hormones, and that shuts down ovulation at the brain level because the brain doesn't know it's 2020 and that you're trying to not eat insulses and eat them in the office at 2 p.m. or whatever. Your brain believes that you don't have access to food anymore. Holy shit. And that you're unsafe. Wow. So fasting. Yeah. Um, (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That's literally me right now. I'm just like, oh god, okay, yeah, that makes sense. That yeah. makes so much sense. I don't know why. I've it thinks you're on the Serengeti, like and it's like, right, yeah. all the um, yeah, all the lions have died. You're never going to eat again. Mm. 
literally believes that and trying to explain to people that the parts of your brain controlling your hormone system, they're not conscious. They're not the same part listening to this podcast or mm-hmm. scrolling the gram or whatever. It's parts of our brain that are quite primitive. And if you um, don't reassure your brain that you have access to, to resources like food and that you are safe, your period is one of the first things that will be sacrificed because survival trumps ovulation every time. Of course. Would you say uh, when you're working with a lot of your clients that there is a blanket approach to um, you know, getting your body healthier with your period and ovulation and everything like that? Or is everyone quite different? Everyone's really different. Mm-hmm. Everyone's really different. It depends on um, someone's lifestyle, if they have other conditions like endometriosis or mm-hmm. if they're experiencing perimenopause, um, if they have heavy periods, light periods, no period at all. Um, sometimes, you know, fasting, it's not always around things like eating disorders. So some clients will come to see me and they're trying to recover from an eating disorder and their period is part of that. So it's completely individual. Um, so I think you can do your own research, you know, using uh, you know, proper resources, but I do think that that individual approach and taking into account someone's individual needs is actually really important. If somebody doesn't have the budget to to spend the time with somebody like you personally, your platform <laughs> is your monthly. They can start off on your website, they can start off on, on your social media pages, but if they want to go to Google, what are some terms that they can use to research that are good or what are some other resources out there that people can start this journey on um, by themselves that you'd recommend for them to get started on? Mm-hmm. So some of the uh, really incredible, generous resource platforms that I direct clients to, Endometriosis New Zealand is one, yep. mm-hmm. um, and I'm part of a group where uh, every month people can submit questions about endometriosis, and they're distributed to health professionals who donate their time to answer the questions. Amazing. And then that gets published on that platform. There's also a free ebook that you can download on that uh, platform, written by Deborah Bush, who's an endo pain specialist. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it's like 40 pages and it talks about everything from uh, painful sex to, to food and periods, um, bowel habits and periods and how they're linked as well. So that's mm-hmm. a really awesome resource. Uh, I'm a big fan of Dr. Lara Bryden's work. Mm-hmm. I don't know if no. um, either of you have heard of her. She wrote a book called The Period Repair Manual. Um, oh, yes, which, I've read that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the pink book. I call it the pink Bible. Yeah. Um, but it is a uh, an incredible resource. Um, so obviously that's a little bit more affordable than paying for a consultation. But her uh, website also has a lot of evidence-based uh, blogs that she's written and she links all the research um, behind a lot of what she puts out as well. Uh, there's other websites like Health Info. I don't know if you guys have heard of that before. Um, no, that one I definitely haven't. <laughs> Yeah, I think it was actually started by uh, the DHB here in Christchurch, but you can access it all over New Zealand. Mm -hmm. Um, And again, it's written by health professionals, so you can kind of key in keywords um, like irregular period or PCOS or endo or irritable bowel syndrome or whatever it might be, and resources written by health professionals and reviewed every year pop up. Mm -hmm. So those would be off the top of my head a quick fire, the three I would recommend, endo, NZ, Lara Bryden and Health Info. And in like a really general sense, if someone was just experiencing maybe a really painful period, for instance, like what is some um, like foods or things that you can consume that actually can make that experience a lot more tolerable? Like, you know, in the, following up from not having a budget to maybe go see someone like you, what's some like things they could tick off first? Okay, so the first thing is having period pain is not actually normal. So it's normal to have discomfort and it's normal to have cramps, but to be in pain that wakes you or kind of stops you in your tracks and you kind of have to catch your breath mm-hmm. or prevents you from participating in life so missing school or work that mm-hmm. is not normal um, and being able to present to a doctor or a school nurse um, or telling um, an adult in your family if you felt comfortable to do so I think that's really important to check that it's not something um, that can be managed and treated like um, endo or adenomyosis or things like fibroids as well so if someone had come to see me and those things had been ticked off, that's not an issue. Some of the things that I talk about with my clients uh, for period pain is omega-3 supplementation and looking at omega-3 containing foods in the diet. Mm-hmm. I won't get too science because you might, guys might get a bit bored. But uh, yeah. there's something called prostaglandins, are the little rat bags that cause uh, uterine muscles, uh, smooth muscles to contract, and that's what causes the pain. And there's good research to support that omega-3 disrupts those little rat bags, um, so stops you making so many prostaglandins and therefore helps with pain. Um, So 
So I don't know if you guys are familiar with omega-3 containing foods, but oily fish would yep. be the top one. And everyone thinks salmon, which of course is like pretty expensive. Uh, but sardines are pretty cheap and cheerful and mackerel are other high omega-3 containing foods. Mm-hmm. Um, but otherwise, supplementation is a good way to go. Um, so it would be tip one would be omega-3. Can I just jump um, in yeah. and ask, when yes, you're talking you about su- supplements there, are you mm. talking about supermarket supplements? Yeah, my head's gone straight to like fish oil tablets. Yeah. My parents yes, take those right. all the time. Yeah. 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 So you can pick them up yeah. in your local supermarket or pharmacy and that's going to be okay? Absolutely. I tell clients to go to the bargain chemist because it's always cheaper. Nice. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, there's obviously a difference between quality um, and dose often, depending on the supermarket brands, because there's no pharmacist standing there asking you if you're on any medications or if it's safe for you to be taking this. So. Supplements, it should be individualised where possible. Um, but if any listeners have any questions around that, I'm happy to see all those questions and ask uh, be more helpful there. Um, so yeah, omega-3. The other thing I help clients with is tracking your cycle and understanding that if you have a lot of stress going on at the time when you have your severe uh, period days, it's going to feel more painful and you're, more, you're less likely to be resilient to pain. So you don't have to live your life by your cycle. But being aware that if you've you know committed to um, you know, taking someone else's kids for the afternoon and you've committed to hosting a dinner and you've got lots on at work and you're in your heavy period days, your emotional tank's pretty empty already and therefore period pain is a little harder to be resilient to. So helping clients to understand putting in some staff care practices and boundaries around their bleed days can be really, really helpful. And it doesn't have to be pedicures and like spas. It's around, you know, I talk about driving home in silence. So, like, just having some quiet time, mm-hmm. um, you know, reading instead of scrolling on your phone, sitting quietly, having mm-hmm. a nice cup of tea, like, really accessible stuff mm-hmm. just to relax and calm down. Um, the third thing that's awesome for period pain is actually exercise, which people hate when I tell them that because mm-hmm. the last thing they feel like doing. Yeah. <laughs> the last thing they feel like mm-hmm. doing. But when you move your body, you make endorphins, which makes you feel good. And that is the most accessible pain relief that we have. And obviously, there's lots of other benefits of moving your body. It does not have to be running. It does not have to be a 45. It mm-hmm. can be a walk. <laughs> yeah. At 45 it on your period. Insane. I'm such a I'm such a hoe for F45 though. Like I love it. <laughs> but honestly, like on my period days, like I got my period on the weekends. And I've got mine. We've yeah, synced again. Going on. Why oh, we have oh. on a on Monday? It was a cardio day, and I was just like. Nah, I had such a big day and I thought the last thing I want to do at 5pm, get, getting to work at yeah. like 4.30 in the morning at 5pm was go do a cardio session while I've got a heavy period. I was like, nah, I'm done. Well, I'm, I'm going for a nap. And I think you know? that, that plays into what Sarah mm. just said about setting a boundary it's for yourself. Yeah, totally. It's, all, it's intuitive movement, isn't it? I can choose to move my body if I want to, but if I don't want to, I actually don't have to. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. There's this amazing, pe- oh, Lara Bryden? Laura Bryden. Lara. Lara. Uh, and at the same time I read her book, I read this really cool book by Maisie Hill called Period Power. Yes. Yes. So she talks about the oh, four yeah. seasons of your period. So like okay. winter, yeah. autumn, spring, summer, mm-hmm. and how like spring is the week you're ovulating and everything's like, la, and then that week after you have like summer is like everything's fantastic and I'm feeling great. And then autumn is like, oh, I'm starting to get my period. And then winter is like, oh, I have my period and I want to die. Mm-hmm. And looking at when you're tracking your cycle – into booking your meetings ahead. Like if you've got a big presentation, don't book it in the winter week, book it in your summer week. Like move your p- kids' play dates. Like mm-hmm. try and f- as much as you can move your life around your energy levels and your period and all that sort of shit. I just, that was mind blowing to me. Mm. So championing your cycle is kind of like the overall theme or like conversation there. So appreciating that we are not linear beings mm-hmm. and that we have. Uh, different thought processes, different energy. We use fuel differently. We Mm -hmm. sleep differently. We have different moods, libido, depending on if we're in the first half or the second half of our cycle and everywhere in between. So I don't know that it's achievable to say, like, no, I'm not coming to work. (laughs) (laughs) I'm in my winter. I'm out. I don't know. It'll be great. It'll be great. But I think it is, you know, I would love to help you with that task. Would it be okay if I made time for that next week? Like being able to... Um, you know, set boundaries that way or just have appreciation that maybe um, delegating would be great for you that week because Mm -hmm. you're not going to be able to have the capacity to do all those things. That really just spoke to me what you said about we're not linear beings and I definitely want to be a linear being. I want to be a high-performance athlete Mm. and a great wife and vacuum with a gin in my hand and just do it all all every day, seven days a week across the month. Mm -hmm. But that's just not possible. 
It's not. And people get frustrated with their bodies. They get yeah. frustrated. Yeah, that their, you know, F45 session felt great on day 13 and feels like shit on day 30 mm-hmm. or whatever it might be. Mm-hmm. Um, but when you appreciate that, I talk about hormones being like the little puppeteers of your body. They're actually driving it and we're just kind of along for the ride. When you understand that, I think it's, it invites self-compassion, actually. It invites you to think, okay, that makes sense why I'm not on on the ball today or why I'm feeling that way, why I'm more hungry today than I was yesterday. Mm-hmm. It's just, yeah. Um, can you talk about fats and their role in a healthy diet, particularly around hormone transport and regulation? Um, so fats are used in the synthesis of hormones, like I was saying earlier on, um, and healthy fats in the diet um, are all are in lots of different kinds of foods. Fat is also really important for absorbing. If you had fat-soluble vitamins, we talk about water-soluble mm-hmm. and fat-soluble vitamins, so like vitamin A and vitamin D, which boosts your mood. And there's good evidence to support that vitamin D has an um, important role in fertility and reproduction as well, which is mm-hmm. quite interesting. Our ovaries have vitamin D receptors, which I think is fascinating. Wow. We're just learning that. Um, but we can't absorb those fats, those are, sorry, fat soluble vitamins, if we don't have sufficient fat intake from our diet. You know what's also really cool about fat is it, it helps us to feel satisfied and satiated after mm-hmm. food. Mm-hmm. So a lot of us think about eating until we feel physically full based on volume of food, which is absolutely important. I'm all about looking at a plate and feeling really stoked that I've got a, a lot to eat there. But also adding fat to what we eat helps to switch off ghrelin, that hunger hormone. Mm-hmm. And it's not that it's bad to be hungry. It's just it's, I talk about hunger kind of like peeing. If you're going to, you know, no one pees until halfway and then holds on. Yeah, true. Actually, <laughs> true. Right? Mm-hmm. right? Uh, We're like, um, I mean, I've tried. You, it's impossible. You can't do it. But for hunger, for some reason, we try and, you know, I'm just going to eat a little bit and then I'm going to try and try and stop, even though you're not fully satisfied. Mm-hmm. It means you're not done with eating and yeah. you'll want to eat again. Um, sooner and maybe you feel out of control with food when you do allow yourself to eat again or you're just kind of you know you go back to your task at work or school whatever and you're still thinking about food yeah and then you feel shit for thinking about it yeah probably then you feel guilty and shame why am I doing this so I talk about hunger like peeing like we pee until it's done eat until you're done that's uh, that's my new thing that's my new that's my new (laughs) tagline until you're done I'm gonna go update my Instagram bio and I'm like, what? what I pee till I done. I eat till I done. I eat till I done. I love that. <laughs> you both looked at me like, what is this? Mm-hmm. <laughs> what, are some, what are some examples of some of the good fats like to just keep in your diet anyway? Mm-hmm. Uh, good fats are uh, seeds. Seeds are much cheaper than nuts, so I'm all about them. Mm-hmm. Um, and nuts are obviously really helpful. Things like olive oil, avocados. Mm-hmm. Um, Oh, what else can I think of the top of my head? I guess other oils like flaxseed oil, which is really tasteless. So you can put it in things like smoothies quite easily. Oh, wow. goes down a bit of a trend. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's uh, the oils and things like the oily fish that we were talking about earlier, like your salmon, your mackerel, and your sardines as well. So those would be your top ones. How can people be taking care of themselves better, adding fats to smoothies or doing, mm. you know, m- making little tweaks without it pushing over into that? that rexia type of control. Mm -hmm. Now I'm, you know, the same control of I'm missing meals, the same control of I'm fasting, the same control of that. Like how do we encourage people to be a little bit more involved with what they're doing and eating without Mm -hmm. it being like a regime? dictating, like, you know, their whole lifestyle. Yeah. I mean, the concept intuitive eating springs to mind. I don't know if either of you have heard that. And you might notice, Danica, with your children, and when they're born, we're all intuitive eaters. They do not care if it's not 12 o'clock here. If they want lunch at 2.30, they'll have it now. Oh, Maybe yeah. Thank you. Oh, yeah. And, and when they're done with food, they like little people literally turn away from you because when they can't see you anymore, you're not there. Yeah. So, or they will throw food or spit food. They're not being rude. They're just done with eating. My so one-year-old, old, when he's finished, he gets his plate and he just pushes it off his high chair onto the ground and he goes, <laughs> yeah. done, done. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, perfect, perfect. We're all born that way. But then the social constructs that we live in um, around this is what you should eat and if you eat this way, then you're a good person and all that kind of your weight is in your control, that kind of stuff takes over. So I think you can have an appreciation that there are foods that are more nutritious and there's foods that are less nutritious, but there is no moral attachment. You know, an apple is not good in the sense that it never performs CPR or, you know, help an old lady off the road or whatever. Mm-hmm. And chocolate didn't rob a dairy or, you know, commit fraud or whatever. It's, they're both just food. And I think if you help people to see that, 
um, food makes us feel certain ways and maybe they notice if I put more fat in my smoothie, you know, I'm not so hungry at 9am and I can, you know, I'm, I can have morning tea at 10 with everybody else and enjoy that social experience rather than needing to eat my lunch at 9 o'clock because I didn't fuel myself properly. So it's around noticing how does food make you feel, but also what are the flavors that you enjoy? If you hate fish and you're listening to this podcast and Sarah keeps talking about eating oily fish, don't eat fish, eat another source of omega-3 that mm-hmm. you do enjoy and you find satisfying. So listen to appetite, listen to hunger. How do you um, feel satisfied after food? Do you like to chew? Do you like to drink? Um, so, yeah, I think there needs to be a, a softness to it. You can have awareness, but it shouldn't become another diet or mm-hmm. gospel. I love yeah. you. I um, you're, my new, you're my new favourite. I just feel like I just mm. want to breach through this computer and give you a hug. I just feel so Aww. calm. Yeah, I and I. It's so funny you're saying that because um, about the intuitive eating because like and like I was just saying a little earlier, like I've have have a real issue with just not eating and it's not a conscious thing. It's just I can go. I had like I had had a weekend, a whole weekend, and I had one meal. And I was like, what is going on? But I'm still functioning and I'm still, and so, but I never see in my brain, it doesn't seem to tick that I'm hungry. And so I've mm. kind of been struggling with that whole, like just knowing when to eat and knowing when not to eat. But my, I called my dad and I was all stressed out. And my dad just said, go to the supermarket, go grab all the things you like, all the tastes you like, you know, you know, those things, just grab them. And he goes, and go to your snack aisle, get all your favorite little protein snacks, just mm-hmm. only put in the fridge what you want to eat. Mm. And I was like, oh my God, I've never thought about it like that. Cause I'm so, I always feel so guilty about going, Oh, it's summer shred time. I'm doing this F45 challenge. I should only be eating this um, bloody salad with some halloumi. Getting that out of your head, aid. It doesn't have to be perfect. Just eat. People think, you know, that the opposite of control is being out of control. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people hear intuitive eating, like that permission to eat, eat what you want, eat what, you know, what you're craving, whatever. People have the idea in their head that that means that they're going to, you know, um, eat ice cream for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's the case for like day one. But I don't know if you guys have ever been, I don't know, like on a girls' weekend and you've had more cheese, wine, and platter than. Mm -hmm. And then you're over it. Yeah. Yeah. You're over it. You get back on Monday and you're like, God, I want some broccoli. Or like, man, I can't wait to have my smoothie again. I'm sick of having eggs and halloumi and big breakfast and whatever. Mm -hmm. That's intuitive eating. That is totally intuitive eating. My mind is seriously like. I'm just oh, blown. mind blown. Mind blown. <laughs> That's awesome. One of the, um, just give you a quick little tool that I use with clients that people might find helpful. So often people will come to see me and they say, like, what should I eat? And because of that intuitive eating work that I do, a lot of my questioning is like, what would you like to eat? And what have you noticed keeps you going? Or what kind of taste do you like? But kind of one rule, I'm doing inverted comma things with my hands, um, is the rule of three. So I invite clients to think about when you're preparing a meal, Think of three colors that you could include, three textures, and three flavors. Oh. And if you, if you tackle the rule of three, so three colors, three flavors, three textures, you're pretty much covering your basis with calories and with the food groups, and you get lots of satisfaction from that food. And if people need a rule to hold on to, it's a really gentle rule that people can use that I think is quite positive. So you can take you know, your egg on toast in the morning and add spinach or yeah. tomato. Now you've got the rule of three. You might take your muesli and yogurt in the morning and now you've added a kiwi fruit. Now you've got your rule of three. It's fun. <laughs> oh, my gosh. That has just, like, made my life. It has changed my life. It's so, so cool. simple. <laughs> and, yeah, you're holding on to the rule rather than the things. All right, Sarah, so what are, like, three things that anybody can do right now to get them on the right journey to just having a nice, healthy period, healthy body, mind, everything? Number one, I would encourage uh, everybody who experiences a period to track their cycle. Mm -hmm. So you can do that using a good old calendar. My mum used to make me, like, cross (laughs) the day that I got my period on the family calendar, which is kind of embarrassing. Your mum sounds woke. Yeah, she's like, you woke. I'm going to tell her that I don't know what it means. <laughs> um, so she would make me do that. So you count your period as day one of your cycle is your first bleed day. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And if you count to your next day one, that gives you your average length of cycle. And there's lots of information. I'll end up waffling. But, um, you know, having a, a cycle somewhere between 21 to 35 days is considered normal. Mm-hmm. So if it's uh, more frequent than that or less often than that, then that deserves attention. So there's a good old calendar, there's a paper diary, there's lots of free apps that you can use on a smartphone. So Flow, Clue, My Cycles. If you have an iPhone, the health app that's in there also Mm -hmm. has a cycle tracker and they all use the same algorithm. So I would get to know your cycle and track your cycle would be number one. 
Number two, um, I would eat. And I know that sounds really simple, but I would prioritize lunch breaks and mm-hmm. protect lunch breaks. It's one of the big things I see people missing out on in their day. Yeah. Avoid bad diets like fasting and keto um, because they're not healthy for your cycle. Um, and number three, I would think about, I guess, stimulants um, of stress hormones, so things that contain caffeine. So because <gasps> no, of my lifeblood. I know all this mm. coffee thing. So it's funny, whenever I talk to clients about caffeine, they physically move away from yeah, me. Yeah, I think I just did. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, come back here, drag them back to the Um Caffeine, it makes you produce adrenaline. So it's a stimulant. Mm-hmm. And one coffee a day, there's no way that causes harm. In fact, it's probably quite helpful for our health. But I see a lot of people who are who are fatigued from modern living or they're using, you know, coffee instead of eating a meal. And mm-hmm. um, they have caffeine, they then feel tired, they don't sleep well, the mm-hmm. next day they have all coffee and round and round it goes. Take and pointing to that- myself here. Yeah, it's those it's those four thirty AMs, you know. Like you, I have a coffee, and then after the show, another coffee, and then it's like two PM. I'm like, oh, haven't eaten. I've just had three coffees. Yeah, that's it. Mm-hmm. So I totally relate to that. Mm-hmm. Do you know? That, do you know how long caffeine stays in your system? No, it has a half life of eight hours. So if you are having caffeine after midday, it yeah. is most certainly in your system when you're trying to fall asleep at night. And it doesn't necessarily in that quantity affect you being able to fall asleep, but being able to get into that deep restorative sleep is so important for your health. So the caffeine, I think just appreciating that uh, stress management and part of that is caffeine is really important for cycle health and for Mm -hmm. hormone health in general because of that relationship between the hypothalamus and your brain. Um, Having an internal system that perceives safety and having a regular cycle because of that relationship with ovulation. And I, um, I think that coffee intake is like the new smoking and that mm-hmm. in an office environment, it's the socially acceptable, you know, like in the, the 60s and 70s, whatever it was, I'm going to go out for a fag. And that was completely acceptable mm-hmm. for, you know, Sarah to be taking a second or a third break in the day. And now if Megan was like, hey guys, I'm just going to get a coffee. It's like, oh my God, of course, off you go. Mm. Um, it's time for yourself. It's, you know, $4, um, which feels like a nice kind of treat me moment in the middle of the day. So I ask my clients to think about the one you love the most because there's one coffee in there that's most precious mm-hmm. and the, and everybody knows straight away. They're like, yeah, that one. The others are there for a different purpose. It might be around doing something, getting a change of environment, having a con- connection with the staff at the cafe down the road or whatever it is. Yeah. <laughs> but have a think about that and um, maybe invite yourself to think if there's anything with your caffeine habits you might want to change. Oh. Amazing. And um, Sarah, if there's anywhere, like where's a direct place that we can um, send anyone listening who maybe wants to get in contact with you personally or just get in touch with you on your Instagram, do you want to just plug yourself? Plug yourself. Oh, I hate uh, plug, plug yourself. Um, it sounds like a tampon ad maybe. <laughs> um, so my Instagram handle is at your monthly and my website is uh, yourmonthlyclub.co.nz um, and I've got like a, a contact uh page on my website so um, I love hearing from people and to share their stories with me and um, I I welcome questions and conversation I think it's really important so I work with clients on the Zoom Um, I've got um, I I sound like a a bit of a show off when I say this but I've got clients um, in the US and Australia and um, Aotearoa girl you're international I know. Hey honestly (laughs) thank you so so much like I I have to say I'm, I'm not even being bias but this has to be one of my favorite episodes because there's actually so much i've taken from it you're very welcome thank you for having me no no worries take nice care you all. wow honestly i was so in awe of that entire chat because there's so much that sarah says that i was connecting with and she sort of broke it down in such layman's terms that i was like oh this is so easy for me to consume so easy and yeah. so calm and so cool like there's yeah. just so many things i want to jump into like i want to go home and i want to eat until I'm full Mm -hmm. like I pee until I'm finished I want to um, I, I love the rule of three thing. I'm already thinking. Yep. You know, like in the morning, I have mm-hmm. wheat bix with yep. banana, and I'm already like, oh shit, I should be adding yogurt, or yep. what else can I be doing? I already was thinking like my little coconut yogurt with my granola. I'll just add a banana. Yeah, that's three different textures, three different colors, three different food groups. So I think that's definitely the biggest thing I'm going to take away from that, and also the caffeine consumption. 
I am such a sucker for a coffee yep. and I have already identified in my head which is the one that is special to me. What is it? And it's the one I get into work, I finish recording, doing some pre-records and just before the show starts I go make a coffee. That's your and special that's like, one. That's my special one so I'm like that's the one I'm going to keep close to my heart and it's the only one I need for the rest of the day. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a one coffee per, uh, one coffee a day person, max mm-hmm. two mm-hmm. so I feel like I'm okay on that yeah. um, but uh, I'm definitely the first one for me when I either wake up in the morning or I'm at home. That's my special one. So trying not to have that mid-morning or lunch one like yeah. I did when I brought it in here on the record. Like, was that really needed or was it mm-hmm. I'm just leaving the shared space, mm-hmm. pop it into the studio, I'll grab a coffee on my way out. Yeah. I think that's what it, more, what it was. It was 100%. just a habit. And it was just that, that whole chat was just very, very empowering and I hope that anyone listening feels the same way. That, like, you know, we're not always going to get it right, but, you know. But that's okay. And it's okay if you don't feel like you've got all the reasons you need just making a few little simple tweaks can actually like go a long way especially with making your um, body just feel a bit better especially yeah. when it comes to a period and if anybody wants to get into the next level of detail um, season two is where we're going to be dropping serious focused episodes on endometriosis on polycystic ovaries mm-hmm. on on you know real information on how to affect change when it comes to different conditions so this was just this was just your entree mm-hmm. into a little bit of what you can do to look after yourself I like that a little tease just little, dropping a little yeah. bit here and there just a little bit of mackerel yeah <laughs> a little bit of fish oil a little bit of fish oil for you alright so that is episode 3 episode 4 next week we are catching up with a very close friend of mine Danny Fennessy she's worked with me on uh, My FM. she now has her own podcast Diaries of a Dyke and we're talking about periods and taboos mm, I'm looking forward to this one What's Mm -hmm. it like to be in a same-sex relationship where you both get your period? Exactly. What are some different myths that are out there that, you know, we need to talk about? Mm -hmm. And I can tell you right now, Danny doesn't shy away from a single topic. She is as open book as they come. And our conversations naturally just as friends are so like nothing's off limits. Yeah. It's it's amazing. So I'm so excited for that next week. Periods and taboos. See you next week. Laters. The Period Place Podcast. Thanks to our mates at You by Cotex. Find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter and TikTok at The Period Place. Hosted by Danica Revel and Tegan Yawur. Special aroha to Sarah Mickelson. Produced by Carl Thompson and project managed by Heidi Thompson. Both from Blue and Ginge Creative.